Let's get technical. James. Raf. How many $50 bills did you pull out of the ATM on the weekend? Quite a few because uh, I'd heard word, Mm -hmm. word on the street, whispers, uh, that the bank was out of money. The banks are out of money. (laughs) The banks are out of money. And you know what? I gave, uh, probably shouldn't be saying this actually on a podcast because I don't want to incite panic or fear or anything. I gave my local branch a call, Commonwealth Bank, and asked them, you know, just between you and me, are you running out of money? And what they told me was pretty shocking. Actually, they said, got some shrapnel, various denominations of silver coin, a few golds, a few notes. But apart from that, we're fresh out. (laughs) Bank run. (laughs) Good old fashioned bank run. Yeah, no, it's been a little while since we've had one. It's very old school. It's very Great Depression. I like saying that. <laughs> There's kind of crypto bank runs. I, I don't know if they count. In fact, they definitely don't count. <laughs> it's, it's all it's all funny money, doesn't? But you know, it's the same dynamics. So it was kind of cool to see one play out via the internet. Yeah, we had about it. I'd say probably from Thursday to Sunday. Yeah, it was all about the bank run. It was all about the yeah, get your money out of the bank because it doesn't have any money left, which is a message that I'm always spreading. Yeah. Always. But yes, we're talking about Silicon Valley Bank and all the, the foolishness that transpired over the weekend. Mm-hmm. As a listener of Down Around, you may be intimately familiar with what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, or you may have just heard people talk about it quite a lot and you've got no idea what's going on. So let's cut through the bullshit. Mm-hmm. Let's tell you how it went down. Let's yeah. tell you what, exactly what failed with Silicon Valley Bank. And also, backing up a little bit, talking about what Silicon Valley Bank even is, mm. it wasn't just about the failure of a bank. There was a lot of weird politics and online tech industry stuff going on that's worth sort of unpicking. In unpacking. many ways, more interesting. Yeah, totally. Because as it turns out, um, as of recording, it seems like the US government, the FDIC, is stepping in and basically resolving the situation without a great deal of fuss. This mm. may have put change by the time you listen to this. I, I suspect it will largely still be true. Yeah, but the stuff that kind of went on around it was almost, as, was, as you say, more interesting. In that seemingly the minority position was, I think this will all be resolved by Monday. Yep. Of which I was one. <laughs> yeah, no, check, check the tapes. This, this guy was predicting. But I, I felt like I was going completely crazy because it seemed like this will probably resolve pretty quickly yep. without too much harm done to anyone other than shareholders in the bank and possibly creditors. But otherwise... I'm failing to see what the, to the point where I think I did uh, jokingly panicked the banks are out of money, you know, like get to the bank, get your cash out, tweet. And jokingly, then, unlike the other people. <laughs> well, and then like subsequently there was an actual like panic being sown by uh, supposedly enlightened minds yeah. on Twitter. And yeah, as I said, like this will probably work out pretty swiftly was the minority position. Anyway, what happened? What's a bank okay. run? Yeah, what's, what's a bank run? What's a bank? What's money? Is money real? I don't know. It's not, not, for, not for me to say. But look, we'll start with what is Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. Even though it sounds like a cool, hip neobank that might have only been formed in the past three or four years and has, you know, colourful debit cards and a cool app. No, it's been around for a little while. It's a regional bank in California. It was started in the early 1980s. And as you can imagine from the name, Silicon Valley Bank, its uh, target clientele was people in you know the tech sector, companies in the tech sector. If you start a business, you've just got a bunch of funding, you've got a couple million dollars in funding for your new tech startup, you plonk it in Silicon Valley Bank. Yep. So they built really great relationships with the industry and a few others that are kind of in the area. They also served a lot of like Napa Valley winemakers, mm. but the core of their business was tech startups. And there are a few reasons for that. They built great relationships, they the people they really went after, but also they were one of the first banks and remain and still to this day were kind of like the one of the few that that did this that were willing to sort of extend credit to uh, people in the industry who were kind of rich on paper in that they had a lot of stock options or yeah. or equity in companies but not actually a lot of uh, liquid cash, liquid assets. So that that meant that like, you know, if you were working at like a high growth startup that hadn't gone public and you just had a, a fair chunk of equity, you could borrow against that yeah, with exactly. value back. Whereas most banks would be like, that's risky Absolutely as hell. Not. No, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. If you started a business and that business is now worth a hundred million dollars, but you're still drawing kind of a small salary and 
technically you own 50% of it, you founded it and you own half of it and you're worth quote unquote $50 million, you don't have $50 million. You have to go to a bank and find a bank that's willing to loan you, like say like, hey, my equity is worth $50 million. I, I'd like to buy a $10 million house, please, and find a bank that's willing to do it. Silicon Valley Bank yep. was willing to do and, it. And they, they created kind of the, they helped, that wasn't just them, but they were one of the only ones to do that initially. They also created the environment where, you know, founders are kind of happy to not IPO super quickly and wait for a while mm. because they can fund their profligate lifestyles. That's not fair, but, you know, earlier than they, they would otherwise by, you know, financing essentially. Yeah, which is, that's a key point. And worth reiterating because it might have something to do with explaining some of the antics that went over on over the last 72 hours. Yep. If you are a founder, typically the only way you get money is by selling your business, either by going public on the stock market or selling it to someone else. If you're a VC who invests in a startup, you make more money the later that it goes public, basically. The bigger it gets, obviously, the bigger the company gets before it gets sold to someone or goes public, the more money you make. So it's in your interest for the founder to not sell too quickly or want to sell too quickly. Yeah. Just just worth noting right here and now. Totally. And Bit yeah, of chilling it, foreboding. Yeah, exactly. And if you're a founder, it's like, God, I've been working on this business for five years. I haven't seen a payday. I've been slaving my ass off. I have no money. I would like to start catching the friggin' private jets and buying the fancy houses. Then yeah, having a bank that will give you this cash. Yep. Allows you to do that. Yep. And as a result, they owned a huge amount of the startup ecosystem as much as like 50% of extend startups or banking with Silicon Valley Bank. The heart of the problem happened when we had the tech boom over the past few years. And what that meant was a lot of investors pumping a lot of money into startups. And what were these startups doing? They were taking the money that they were being given by investors and banking it with Silicon Valley Bank, mm -hmm. who saw their balance sheets absolutely explode. Yeah. So we had an insane tech market bull run over the past number of years. These accounts got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. To give you a, a history of fractional reserve banking, mm -hmm. what's the business model of a bank? They turn short-term obligations into long-term assets, essentially. Customers will put money into a bank to store there in order to you know pay the interest to the customers on those deposits and what have you and make profit as a bank. You need to take those deposits and turn them into something that's going to make money. Yeah, typically that's home loans. Yeah, mortgages, that, that kind of stuff. But the problem with Silicon Valley Bank is that Startups and people who are at startups, who work for startups, don't actually need those products mm. at quite the same level as what they're depositing. So, for example, you know, a startup, you can take on what's called quote-unquote venture debt as a startup where you actually borrow money from a bank for your startup, but it, it's high interest. A lot of startups are not comfortable doing it. Mm. Investors don't really advise it. No, so you're better not, off raising capital. You, you like better, if, a, if a bank, which has, I'm going to be perfectly honest, more due diligence than a lot of VCs, <laughs> is willing to loan you money for interest, you probably can get, you can raise capital from a VC. For sure. because Without you, having to pay interest on it. Totally. So or that, pay it back. <laughs> so Silicon Valley Bank was doing, like it was off, offering mortgages to people to deposit. Like they did all that kind of stuff. But their main problem was, they couldn't create loan products or credit products or or anything like that at the same rate as what their accounts were growing at. Mm. So their money was on on hand was absolutely ballooning, but they couldn't get that money out the door quick enough. So what did they do? Again, to reiterate, this is how banks make money. Yeah, like totally. a bank. Most of you are probably not paying even ten dollars a month account fee because the bank is using that money to make loans or park it somewhere and make more money than you're paying off it. Like that is how banks make money. Yep. So yeah, if you've got a shitload of, of deposits and you can't make the loans, you need to somehow turn it into money somehow. Yeah, exactly. So and what did Silicon Valley Bank do with their vast trove of deposits? Deposits, which obviously if you're going to a bank, like you expect to be able to withdraw immediately, right? Yeah. If it's a large sum of money within 24 hours. Well, they had options. One option was to buy T bills, treasury bills. But as we know, treasury bills, as in, the, you know, the, this is like interest rates set by the Federal Reserve in America, whatever, and the RBA in Australia equivalent, were returning 0.25% interest rates because interest rates were super low. Yeah. That's not a lot of profit. No. If you're a bank, if that's like the most money you can make off deposits, that's probably barely paying for the upkeep on those accounts. So they went looking for alpha. They went looking for how do we make money off um, these accounts? They invested it instead in a relatively, or in fact, a very safe asset, which is mortgage-backed securities, 
which delivered 1.45% interest. So I deposit my $1 million that I've got from my startup into Silicon Valley Bank. They're parking it in a um, mortgage-backed securities and earning 1.45% on it. So they're making 1.45% profit per annum on my $1 million dollars and just providing banking services for me. The problem with mortgage-backed securities is that they were 10 years. So, I mean, it's not really a problem, to be perfectly honest, but it's it's money over the course of 10 years. It's yep. more of a long-term asset. Yep. Um, you're expecting to get your $1 million dollars back plus 1.55% per year over 10 years. Yep. As you said, but just to reiterate, these are like considered very, very safe and basically cash like very liquid assets, generally speaking. But again, basically this podcast exists to examine. That was in a low interest rate environment. Yep. Interest rates started going up. Now we have to explain how bonds work. So if you have, should we just, should we do it? Yeah. Or should we just blaze over it? Okay. The whole thing though with these bonds, right? So interest rates start going up. That 1.45% is now up at, well, originally it was up at, you know, 1.75% or 2%. Not for the bank. The bank's already signed a contract that they are getting 1.45% over the course of 10 years. But if I'm someone who wants to park my money, buy bonds or buy mortgage-backed securities, I'm obviously not going to buy them off the bank for 1.45% because the bank can sell these bonds, right? They can on-sell them. If, if I want to withdraw my $1 million, the bank can then sell these mortgage-backed securities. It's $1 million yep. worth of mortgage They don't have to wait the 10 years. They can sell it on the secondary markets. They, yeah. they can sell them immediately. But if if I can buy a bond for 2%, that gives me 2% per year, I'm obviously not going to buy the 1.45% no. bonds unless the person selling them sells them for cheaper. So it basically works out to be 2% per year. That's what happens. This is, this is what happens with bonds. As... Interest rates go up, the price of bonds goes lower on bonds that were put out at earlier rates. Bond prices go down as interest rates go up. That's just the key thing that- yeah, just, just remember that. And just from the perspective of Silicon Valley Bank, you just got to think that they basically made a bet that interest rates were going to go up. Yeah. So as, as many people did in if, many ways. If they want to see, exactly. So if you want to withdraw your $1 million and- interest rates have gone up to 2%, Silicon Valley Bank can't sell that $1 million for $1 million plus 1.5% anymore. It has to sell it for you know $950,000 so that it balances out to the same as the 2% interest rates. Yep. But yes, they bet that that was never going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and you know many people in, in various ways made that bet you know, <laughs> um, across the whole sector and the world. And, and actually, it is worth saying here because one of the big criticisms was how a Silicon Valley Bank to know the Fed said, and the Federal Reserve, and the same is true of um, the RBA, and maybe Philip Lowe should be sacked. Maybe, I don't know, that interest rates weren't going to move. Not like for the, a while, at least. Yeah. The forward guidance, I mean, in Australia, it was like, they're not going to be put up through 2023 or whatever. There was some kind of guidance around yeah. like that. And then obviously, they have jacked them. So yes, the reserve banks did get it wrong. Like the Federal Reserve, et cetera, got it wrong. And this is one criticism. It's like of the David Sachs of the world that they were rug pulled by the Fed. Yeah. Or Bology. They were rug pulled by the Fed. The Fed said that interest rates were going to stay low, but then they jacked them. They got rug pulled. Now they're screwed. The Fed screwed yep. them. Again, it's worth saying they could have sold those mortgage-backed securities for a very small loss. Yeah. Like the, the minute that interest rates started going up, they could have sold them, but they didn't. They didn't do it. They hung out and waited, and then they climbed up further and further, and the situation got more dire. Interest rates go up, yep. startup funding dries up. Yep. What this means is the bank isn't getting any money yep. anymore. A, they're getting less money from people depositing into there. But B, there are plenty of startups that are like, oh, shit, we actually need to start pulling some money out yeah. to pay for like our various obligations. Yeah. So they were getting money drained outwards. Yeah. Um, startups were burning through cash without topping up their accounts, basically. Yep. Um, I.e. spending money. They're taking money out of their deposit accounts. Yep. And Silicon Valley Bank had to meet these obligations and realized, shit, we need to draw down some of these 10-year um, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and sell them at a loss because now interest rates are up at 5% or whatever. Well, slightly under. So they went to the markets and said, we're going to sell some shares because we need to basically cover these bonds. We need to sell at a loss. Yep. We need to mark to market in order to play depositors and everyone freaked out. Everyone freaked out. And this is the <laughs> this is the key thing. You know, you can be a, um, a big financial egghead and think about all these cool market dynamics and how price signals interact with this and that. But when it comes to like people freaking out, it no longer is bound by like the rules of financial logic. People just go off their nuts sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> There's no science to it. So uh, this basically cascaded into a serious problem. Yeah. Because people looked at that and 
Silicon Valley Bank did not communicate this very well. No. Like the first whiff from most people that something was wrong was them being like, oh, we have to raise $5 billion to cover this this little thing that we're doing. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, obviously the, the press release they did was really like markets oriented. It wasn't really about for their customers or whatever. Obviously this started to snowball. The venture capitalists who, you know, had portfolio companies that had money with Silicon Valley Bank and the VCs themselves started to be like, the banks are running out of money. Yes. <laughs> Well, Peter Thiel apparently started at Founders Fund. Founder, Peter Thiel's fund, Founders Fund, was that was the first time it was announced that like a major VC was doing something about it. Yeah. And when you hear that, you know. Uh, yeah. When Peter Thiel's saying Peter the Thiel's- banks are out of money. Yeah, exactly. you you gotta, you got to believe him, you know. Um, you know I, we probably don't need to tell you, but one of the underpinning facts of the banking system, fractional reserve banking, banks actually don't have the liquid money on hand for the reasons we just talked about, yeah. to actually supply that level of withdrawal. This is not just a Silicon Valley Bank issue. This is something that, that you know, it's the same for the Commonwealth Bank. It's the same for anything. They yeah, don't, yeah. They, if you get hit by a bank run, which, as we said, can be deeply illogical yeah. and it, and spins out of control really quickly, that, can, that immediately becomes a serious problem. Yeah, banks will have typically, and this is like, they're quote unquote overcapitalized since the global financial crisis, like 10 to 15%. It's seen as a very well capitalized bank, i.e., like they've got about that much cash that they're able to yep. dispense out. So if 20% of people are asking for their money, they won't have it. Yep. Well, at least they, they won't have it for a while because they've got to do what we're talking about. I mean, a typical bank, as we said, will they'll give your deposits to someone over a 30 year mortgage period, right? Like it's a, these yep. are not highly liquid assets. And again, I, not, I want to stray from getting too technical, but it's worth bringing up. This was this is what banks want, and in this case as well, like why didn't people notice that this bank was incredibly exposed interest rates like this, that they had all this money in mortgage-backed securities and they had this massive hole in their balance sheet? The reason is banks basically have fought to. You don't have to consider mortgage-backed securities as illiquid assets or mark them down. You know, I'm saying like bond, like the price of bonds goes down as interest rates go up. You don't have to mark to market. You don't have to on your balance sheets report that your bond investment, that your mortgage-backed securities are worth less. You can just keep quoting it at the sticker price, like what you originally paid for it, because as long as you hold on f- onto it for 10 years, you it don't is. Yeah, you don't make a loss. As long as you don't sell early, you will make your million dollars plus 1.45% interest per year over 10 years. So you can keep reporting that you haven't lost any money, even though in reality, those bonds are worth far less. Yep. And some, well, it's not even a loophole, it's not a loophole, it's built into the system, basically, that allowed banks to keep reporting these assets as what their 10-year price is. Yeah. So, as a result, and very, very quickly, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. Yeah. And again, nature of a bank run, you've got to be within that first 10% to get your money out. Yeah. Otherwise, the money's not there. It's- so, as a, when a, that's why it's a run. That's why it's a run. <laughs> you've got to run. You've got to run the bank. It's, they're out of money. Come on. <laughs> that immediately became the second largest bank collapse in American history after Washington Mutual, which was during the um, the global financial crisis in 2008. So you can mm. see why people were a little bit concerned about this. Um, but this was really only kind of the start of the story. It's worth pointing out as well, though, that as we discussed, like the nature of Silicon Valley Bank is, it is quite different to other banks because of that dynamic of it lending basically to founders and having deposits purely from founders. Yep. So there's not a lot of random people with... 10 grand in there. No, totally. And there's not a lot of actual mortgages and other kind of... Their assets were, yeah, as you said, they don't have a standard lending portfolio. It's a a very different lending portfolio. So the FDIC, which is the US regulator that covers this sort of stuff, insures bank deposits up to $250,000. Yeah. So what that means is, is that if your bank collapses and you have under that amount, you are automatically insured for that. Same is true in Australia. Same is true in Australia. We also have a threshold. But because Silicon Valley Bank was in a position where they had a lot of startups banking with them, the vast majority of their customers had well over $250,000 sitting in the bank. There weren't that many sort of like regular guys banking with Silicon Valley Bank who had like a a normal amount of money in there. So this created a huge amount of panic which came after the bank run, which played out on social media, largely Twitter, over the weekend. Yeah. When it looked like startups, which are, I might stress, the foot soldiers of the economy. Oh, yeah. These are the warriors. These are the job creators. These are the job creators. These the are the trenches. The king. Yeah, exactly. They're out there making um, Wi-Fi dog collars. They're out there making OnlyFans competitors. They're out there trying to clone TikTok and get TikTok banned. They're doing all sorts of things that are on the bleeding edge of innovation. Yeah. These companies might struggle 
to do payroll. They might struggle to pay their customers because they don't have access to the money. It's all locked up Mm -hmm. or gone. And then we were staring down the barrel of a Silicon Valley collapse. Yeah. Well, that's what the sort of the the panic merchants were saying. Well, not only that, but if you undermine faith in this bank and people lose confidence in the banking system, it'll be contagious. The contagion will spread from Silicon Valley to Wall Street to Main Street. Yeah. That was what they said. The back channel is very dark right now. Insiders are watching the fuse slowly burn down to the powder keg and we are helpless to stop it. Who said that? Jason Calacanis. On Monday, 100,000 Americans will be lined up at their regional bank demanding their money. Most will not get it. This went from Silicon Valley insiders on Thursday to the middle class on Saturday. Main Street finds out Monday. That's in all caps. Yeah, he, he, he was in a lot of all caps tweets. Uh, Jason Calacanis, just for the who mercifully don't know who this man is, uh, is an angel investor and one of the um, active seats on the All In podcast, which is the number one tech podcast in the world. And if I could say that Dan Rad has sort of like a, a mirror image or an enemy podcast, <laughs> I would say it's, it's the All In podcast. We're trying to carve a new path from their Gen X red pill bullshit, basically. Jason Calacanis, Sunday. Who else is going to buy some guns, provisions and gasoline tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, this is... The caliber of the debate. Yeah. David Sachs. The US banking system is on the cusp of being concentrated in a handful of politically connected, too big to fail banks. One wonders if that's the point. Mm, stern words. Uh, this was kind of the timbre on tech Twitter on the weekend. It was basically predictions that the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank was going to forestall essentially possibly bigger than the 2008 financial crisis. Like the entire US economy and with it, the global economy was going to collapse Mm. unless sleepy Joe Biden pulled his finger out and rescued the bank and ensured the depositors would get their money back. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, the whole thing was going to come down. I might just read one more Jason Calacanis. This one, though, from Friday. Please. Stop complaining about Mr. Beast and go do something productive or interesting yourself. (laughs) That's true. Because, you know, with Silicon Valley Bank down, the only person who's supplying a bit of life into our economy is Mr. Beast. <laughs> this was, yeah, as I said, this was kind of like the tone, this absolute doom profit tone. Now, as your tweet, which turned out to be far more on point than any of the members of the All In podcast, mm-hmm. far more accurate, you can check the timestamps, go to Raf's Twitter and have a look at what he tweeted. You alleged that uh, it would be fine and the FDIC would would figure it out. Yeah, by Monday morning. Yeah, exactly. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. They put out a statement on, uh, well, Monday Australian time that said all depositors are going to get their money back 100% of the time. It's not going to fall onto the taxpayer. It's not a bailout. It's not a bailout. We can argue over it. Well, you can argue over semantics about that. But the point is, but, you know, the executives and the shareholders of Silicon Valley Bank are going to take the heat, but the regular, you know, the hard scrabble regular people, i.e., startups (laughs) startups <laughs> that have their money in the bank will be fine. Yeah. If you deposited money in a bank, you'll be able to get it out. If you're a business, if you're an individual. Yeah. And, and you'll be, not even be able to get it out, you'll be able to get it out really soon. Yeah. As in banks don't work over the weekend anyway. So yeah, so you're fine. Sort of implied it before maybe, but FDIC, when it comes to like American regulators, they are like weapons. They yeah. are the guys who are like banks collapse in the US with more regularity than you might think, but mm. they tend to be relatively small. And this is their playbook. Yeah. Don't, well, you don't hear about it because they yeah. shut the bank down usually just after markets close on a Friday afternoon and then it's recapitalized, either found a buyer or um, there's an ability for depositors to get their money out on yeah, Monday morning. they do 48, a 48-hour 48 sprint and then by Monday the, the bank is, exists in a new form and is sort of ready to, ready to go. Relatively impressive as, as far as sort of like bureaucratic government entities go. But as with all things, this immediately got sucked into the world's most annoying culture war. It was crazy. So like... Peek behind the curtains, when you texted me about, like, obviously we've got to do some Silicon Valley Bank things, and I think that might have been Friday. Yeah, yeah. And I was kind of like, I mean, yeah, it's going to be a pretty boring episode, though. You know, it's kind of an interest rates and, you know, whatever. But, yeah, I guess we've got to do it. And I was like, maybe we can kind of pivot it into something else. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, what we could pivot it into became very apparent immediately because my entire Twitter timeline when I, like, opened it on Saturday was just – literally all about Silicon Valley Bank. I couldn't not see every tweet, like every single frigging tweet was about it because, yeah, it got turned into a way bigger and crazier issue than I think it probably was. 
Yeah. No, so a really representative sort of thing. I'm, I'm, we're going to read out another tweet. This one's from Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI. So he's, you know, the CEO behind ChatGPT and what have you. He did a, uh, <laughs> a long thread on Twitter, which was at the top of it said, ah, oh, fine, here's my SVB thread. As if, you know, everyone was on the edge of their seat for this. Yeah, begging for his take on. Yeah, they were begging. For- and there was one tweet, I think, kind of captured the entire discourse from all these all these guys, be it like the All In podcast people or other investors or other CEOs within Silicon Valley. I believe that if Silicon Valley Bank were instead called Farmers Bank of Santa Clara, they bank a lot of uh, wine growers, we would have had this easily resolved. Unfortunately, it became somewhat political. Mm. Basically, this was the, the discourse, essentially, yeah. that because there is sort of a, a hatred, a jealous hatred, mm. I think, potentially, yeah. for those who are successful in the tech industry, you know, tech luminaries, nothing was going to happen. They were going to let all these people suffer. And laugh. And, and laugh, laugh in their and, la- face. and laugh at them. Obviously, it seems now that the FDRC was doing exactly what their mandated role is mm. and was, like, making this happen over the weekend and now it's resolved. Yeah. So, you know, these people get to do a, a victory lap and say that they spurred them to action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think... That's the most annoying thing in the world is that... <laughs> and I saw this coming on Sunday. I was like, oh, no, I can see exactly what's happening here. They're going to claim by panicking and, like, literally, again, Jason Kalanakis was like, we raised the alarm bells and only three banks failed because, like, by the way... In the meantime, two crypto banks have failed. <laughs> like, yeah. sure. I wonder why that happened. Um, you know, we raised the, the alarm bells. Imagine if we hadn't, you know, they would have just allowed this to collapse and the contagion to spread and every American would have been like standing in line at a bank to withdraw their money on their federally insured yeah, yeah. $250,000 or less. Like the, the thing that was particularly galling about all this is that they were really like amplifying the panic about the contagion, which, mm. you know, because they said, you know, Silicon Valley, if it's allowed to fail and these people aren't made whole, the entire economy goes with it. Yeah, this will spread. And there yeah. was there was showing, like, posting photos of, like, people standing in a line Q- outside Queuing up front of First Republic Bank, Bank, which is another one popular with Silicon Valley founders. Yeah, and saying, like, oh, as I read before, like, this will spread to Main Street. Basically, the banking system is going to collapse unless we get a bailout. Yeah. And, you know, it's particularly funny when it comes to a lot of the Silicon Valley elite because a lot of them are real on the one hand a lot of them are really sort of like libertarian types who think that they can do things better than the sort of tired old arms of government or what Mm. have you and they can reduce all those functionality to an app or a DeFi protocol or or what have you so there there was that side of it and also i think joe weisenthal from odd lots podcast made this point and i think it's basically true so many of these guys were also like pumping the crypto bags so heavy over the past few years. Yeah. And part of pumping the crypto bags is basically pointing and saying the traditional banking system doesn't fucking work. Mm. The Fed is arraigned against you and it's like part of a huge com- conspiracy to hold you down. You mm. need to be doing self-custody and buying all these fucked tokens yeah. and these all these protocols and then for them to come back and be like, you have to save our bank. Yeah. You've got to save our bank by, by giving it a, a lifeline. To be clear... Just so you're you're aware of what our stance is, I think we both agree that you know depositors should be made whole. Yeah, yeah, I think that yeah, it would be good if you could get your money back, no. especially in this case where realistically, like the bank fucked up. They made some very poor investment in these um, MBS mortgage backed securities. But at the end of the day, if you're a business who's just randomly deposited money in like a decent bank, you should yeah. get your deposit I, out. I don't not, think, it's not. It shouldn't be risky. No, I don't think anyone, be they you know a small enterprise or an individual, or whatever, should ever be forced to like evaluate a bank's bank sheet, no, a balance sheet before putting money into it. But look, it all comes down to this, and here's here's where I'm entering the rant zone. So, go off, King. Yeah, thank you. I just I find the politics stuff just so annoying, essentially. Mm. So crash course from me about. Silicon Valley political development. So for many, many years, Silicon Valley and like big tech was considered like one of the power centers of like American liberalism, right? Mm. If you looked at the, the the stats for political donations from people that worked at like Microsoft and Facebook and Amazon and all these companies, insanely weighted towards like the Democratic Party in the US. Because mm. all these people, for the longest time, if you pictured a software engineer working at like a, a top tier American firm, you were imagining like, a hippie guy wears a polo shirt, sandals to the office. Yeah, or, or a crunching social liberal. Yeah, working at Google and just wearing a t-shirt. You know. Yeah, like these were like the 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 vanguard of American liberalism or whatever. Driving uh, a Prius. Uh, 
And this remains true. Those figures when it comes to big tech and stuff are, are still basically the case. Mm. 2016 was a big turning point and people often point, point to this as well where it was like Donald Trump was elected and people blame that on Facebook. Facebook suddenly went from being maybe a slightly cringe website to being like the heart of all evil in the world. Cambridge Analytica happened, talk about surveillance technology and all of a sudden the tech industry was no longer like thought of as kind of like this cool social liberal sort of force and was yeah. like, oh, it's actually bad for the world. Mike Isaac talked about that in their episode. Mm. You know, all these guys were lured into the industry, big pay packages, and then had like the media point of them be like, you're fucking evil. Yeah. You rat bag, you dog. Yeah. Um, and that broke a lot of brains. And then we've seen this like new political development over the last little while where there are these startup guys and VCs or whatever who have basically become red pilled and even more red pilled over COVID where they're like, we're not actually like those guys that work at Meta. We're not like those guys that work at Amazon. We are like frontiersmen. Mm. We're like the new gen. And this aligns with when they all started calling themselves builders. Yeah. They were like, we're not just programmers and growth hackers and, and what have you. We're like builders. We're equivalent to the guys that used to build, you know, the Hoover Dam and used to build Empire State Building, but we're doing it with software and shit. And it came with this like absolutely exhausting political program. Yeah. You know, we're the ones fighting against, you know, wokeism. We're fighting against these stultifying arms of government and shit and like quasi libertarian sort of like we're creating new societies. Yeah. We're build we're building away from like it's part of the reason we even though we live in Sydney, I have to read all these stories about San Francisco being like a liberal hellhole yeah. with like open air drug markets and stuff. Yeah. It's like that's probably true, but also why am I hearing about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's just like it's completely consumed politics over a little while, and we've just seen it play out in this like highly annoying spectacle. Yeah, where like they're there in the universe, and they think that the driving thing is that people are resentful of like the tech kingpins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That everyone goes around all day kind of spitting on the pavement and, like, whispering their names. The other thing to mention is individually in the early 2000s, like, they were kind of lauded more as – like I mean, you see it with Elon Musk is the obvious example. We remember yeah. a, Even a like few what, years what, ago he was seen as kind of king, lauded genius, yeah. put into pop culture, blah, 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 and now he's seen as a bit more of an annoying buffoon. But, like, <laughs> regardless, yeah. the same was true for all these VCs that, you know, their annual letters would be kind of lauded as these genius things that need to be taught in business school, et cetera, et cetera. And now when the tides, quote, unquote, turned against them and it's like maybe these kind of tech solutions to these problems that you're solving, these social problems aren't working and they're possibly being criticised, uh, especially in the last few years when, as I said, one of their genius innovations with things like SPACs, which lost a lot of people a lot of money. And That's obviously- another, another all-in podcast host innovation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and crypto, as you said, like crashing and blah, blah, blah. And now they're actually being scrutinised for it and not lauded as these gods amongst men, these geniuses. That hurts. Uh, 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 All of a sudden they're being criticised and having to answer and they're bitter about it. That's my take at least as well. Like There's a real personal... No, totally. Element, like a spite. Yeah, absolutely. And so we, I had to read all these posts online where it's like they hate you. They hate you and your success. Yeah, they want to see all founders die. And they like, want to see all businesses perish. Any innovator is doomed. They're doing this on purpose. Basically, that was the... Well, yeah. In fact, more than basically, like biology basically said openly that the Fed intentionally did this. They lied about interest rates so that they could crush us. So it could destroy the tech industry. And it's like, I'm sure there are a lot of people that, I, mean, I saw a lot of tweets from people that are like, I do want to see your companies crash and burn. Well, exactly. And suffer, because those people do exist. Yeah, but, those people definitely exist. But, and, and to be perfectly honest, it's not helped by them acting like an annoying idiot on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, I think the great irony of this like positioning is the fact that, yes, like the lefties and liberals have turned on the tech industry, but all these guys are suddenly these tech overlords are like pivoting themselves to be more like right wing. But like the average like right wing Trump head thinks they're all pedophiles anyway. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like they're not distinguishing between like Facebook and some other startup guy. They're like, you are all big tech and you're censoring my like my beautiful clear thoughts, which are truth online and whatever. There was a lot of right wingers who thought that Silicon Valley Bank sh should, should fail, fail because like it was too involved in like carbon credits. Yeah, it, was, it, it was woke. Like <laughs> it was a woke bank. It was like a which is like, you know, it just shows how utterly confusing this kind of thing has. And then the true story is that while these guys were doing this, like, psychodrama uh, pantomime on Twitter, the actual, like, guns who work at the FDIC were, like, resolving the situation. Yeah, the bureaucrats went in there and just got and to work. A cleaned house, as they do normally. It was just, yeah, revealing about the, 
the state of the industry. And also, as Dan Rand talks about a lot, like the growing pains that come with coming out of that zero interest rate environment. Yeah. In summation, the point that I would make, and maybe you would agree, uh, the banks are out of money and you need to get down to your local bank and get it all out now. You've got to go fast. Don't be the 90%. They've only got 10% in there. Just get down the street. Run. Go. <laughs> down Round is now a premium podcast. Yeah. You can subscribe to our premium offering at downround.net for $7 a month or $70 a year if your uh, bargain's inclined. And you get not only the episode that you get every week, but one additional one every single week, $7 a month. It's a great bargain. We go deep on... Uh, this is a terrible one. <laughs> no, it's fine. You're right. We go deeper on the issues. We say more crazy shit. Yeah, exactly. exactly. If you want to hear us say stuff that's basically walls to the wall, maybe even illegal, maybe illegal, downround.net, you'll find us there. 